result of the story of Hanukkah, the miracle of Hanukkah. As a result of the story of Hanukkah, so we know that it wasn't just a matter of getting rid of the Yavanim. So they got rid of the Yavanim from the base of Migdash. And then, as we know, as we'll see in a second, the Chashvanoyim that had the schus of getting rid of the Yavanim and giving us the Yant of Hanukkah, the Chashvanoyim established the Malchus. They established the kingdom of Malchus based Chashvanoyim, the kingdom of the Chashvanoyim of Kahanim. And it lasted uh, close toward, towards the end of the second base of English. It lasted for about 200 years. So th- that's a historical fact that after the story of Hanukkah, they established the Jewish kingdom, a malchus that they were the kings of. In Marmokka number one, we're going to see in the Rambam that this is not just a historical fact. The Rambam seems to indicate that this is part of the celebration of Hanukkah, part of the joy and the simcha of Hanukkah is not just the removal of the Greeks from the base of Migdash and the miracle that took place, but it's the restoration of Malchus Yisrael, the restoration of the Jewish kingdom, and the fact that we're able, that we, that we had the schus to be, uh, you know, to be uh, self-governing, that we had our Malchus back, headed by the Chashmanoim. So take a look at the first Marmachim you have. This is the beginning of Hilchas Hanukkah in the Rambam. Bebay Yisheni, says the Rambam, the second base of English, it gives us again a little bit of a historical overview. The Rambam writes, by the way, we'll, maybe, maybe we'll see about this a little bit later on. The Rambam writes in his introduction to Mishnah Torah that all you need to know to learn all you need to know is Tanakh, and then you could have his Sefer, and you're good to go. So Tanakh and Mishnah Torah. So the Rambam, therefore, takes it for granted, he take, as an assumption that you know Tanakh. But the story of Hanukkah is not in Tanakh, it's post-Tanakh. So because of that, the Rambam feels necessary to explain the history of Hanukkah and the story of Hanukkah, because, again, he's just assuming you know Tanakh, and then he opened his Sefer. So the Rambam says like this, Vivayi Sheni, in the second, Bisa Migdash Kishamolchu Yavan. When the Greeks were were ruling over us, they laid decrees upon us. They 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 decreed heavy decrees upon the Jewish people, but with us, and they tried to eradicate Yiddishkeit. And he goes on to talk about some of the details. But again, same until the Rebbeinu Shlomo, the God of our ancestors, had Rachmanes on us, and saved us from their hands, and uh, and rescued us. And that salvation and that rescue was through the Chashmanayim, the governor of Bnei Chashmanayim, Gdoilim, and the sons of the Chashmanayim, the family of Chashmanayim, were the, the family of Kahanim Gdoilim. So they were victorious over the Yavanim, the Hargum, and they killed the Yavanim, by Yishu, Yisrael, Miyadam, and, and saved us from their hands. The Rabbanah Shalom saved us through them. The Hemidu Melech Mena Kahanim, and says the Rambam, and they established a king from that family of Chashmanayim, they established a king over the Jewish people, the Chazr Malchus the Yisrael, Yisrael Mashal Masayim Shana. And the Malchus of the Jewish people returned to its place for more than for close to for a little bit more than two hundred years. Ad Chorban Hashem until the destruction of the second base of English. Now again, the Rambam is not just telling us things that are just on history historical facts. There's a lot more details, you know, in Jewish history that the Rambam could fill us in on. He's telling us things that are relevant to understand and to appreciate the other Hanukkah. So the Rambam is throwing the fact in is that the Jewish people had a Malchus and Malchus based Chashmonai existed for two hundred years for a little bit over the two hundred years. The Ram is putting this, the Ram is mentioning this to us because he's clearly telling us that this is a point of celebration. This is part of what we're, what we're celebrating on Hanukkah. It's not just the victory over the Yavanim, but it's the reestablishment of Malchus Yisrael through the Hashemunai. Okay, that's the Ram. So from the Ram, it would seem, it's pretty clear, that the restoration of Malchus Yisrael and the establishment of Malchus based Hashemunai, the kingdom of the Hashemunai, is something to celebrate. Okay. Now, on the other hand, there's the famous opinion of the Ramban. The Ramban in, par- in Marmokka number two, this is in Parshat Vayichi. <coughs> the Ramban is going on the Pasuk, it says in Pasuk that Yaakov Avinu blesses each one of the Shvatim. And regarding the tribe of Yehuda, Yaakov Avinu says, Lo yasr shevet mi Yehuda, mi vein raglov, that the scepter, rulership, malchus, kingship, should not leave from Yehuda, lo yasr shevet mi Yehuda, u mechaykik vein raglov, nor should the deciders, the rulers, move from his descendants. In other words, Yaakov Avinu is blessing Yehuda with malchus, with kingship, with royalty, that the Jewish malchus should be in Shevet Yehuda. Okay? Says the Ramban, based on that, in Parshat Vayichi, it's a whole long discussion the Ramban has over there, but the paragraph that's relevant for us. The Ramban is referencing to us a concept that we find in the Gemara. The Gemara says in a, in a few places that Although the Malchus of the Hashemunayim, like the Rambam says, lasted for over 200 years, but what happened after that? So when Hordus, when, when King Her- when Herod, Herod, uh, you know, when you go to Israel, you go on the, the tours, you know, they always bring you 
show you about King Herod, he built this, he built that. He, he was this uh, great person. He was, a, he was a rush, he was not a good person. He was an Evid, he was a slave, an Evid Kanani, to the house of Hashmanoim. And he led a rebellion against his masters, against the Hashmanoim, again, 200 years after Hanukkah. And he slaughtered them, he destroyed their family. And the Gemara says, that, and he took over the Malchus. And so Hurdus, Herod, was an Evid of the Hashmanoim, and he wiped them out, and he continued on the Malchus on his own, and then eventually, and he was sort of a puppet to the, to the Romans, and it led to the destruction of the second base of Migdash. Arkadei Kach, the Gemara says that anyone that claims to be a descendant of the Hashmanoim really is a descendant of Herod. He's an Evid. He's not a Hashmanoim. There are no left. So the Ramban, Obir Parshish Reichi, is asking, how could be such a thing? Why do they deserve such a punishment that their entire family is wiped out, the, one that, the ones that gave us Hanukkah? So says the Ramban famously, And this is the explanation of the punishment that fell upon the Chashmanoim, who were the kings during the second base of Megdash. These were big tzaddikim. And if it wasn't for the Chashmanoim, Yiddishkeit would be forgotten. They give us Hanukkah, they return Yiddishkeit to its glory. So they're tzaddikim. But despite all of that, they had a great uh, punishment. And the punishment was so intense that it gets to a point where Chazal said such a thing, that anyone that even claims and thinks that they have, that their Messiah, that their Yichas goes back to Chashmonayim, he's after who he's in heaven. He is, there, are, there are no Chashmonayim left. And they were all destroyed. Why? What was the big Avera that they did? This Avera. This Avera. Uh, Yaakov Avinu said, well, you also shave with me Yehuda, that the Malchus has to be in Shevet Yehuda. And the Hashmonoim went against that command of Yaakov Avinu. They were not from the ch- tribe of Yehuda. They were not from the family of David, who is a uh, family within Yehuda. They went against that edict of Yaakov Avinu. And because of that, they were eventually wiped out. They siru hashevet v'amachaykik and they moved the scepter and, and rulership from the tribe of Yehuda, which is exactly what Yaakov Avinu said you should not do. And because of this, the punishment that they received was Mida Kineged Mida. Just as what was, in other words, just as the, all the other tribes are sort of servants, in a certain sense, to Yehuda, and so what did the Hashemunayim do? They rebelled against their master, right? So Yehuda is supposed to be the Melech, and they, they went against that, and they established themselves as king. So Mida Kineged Mida, their servants rebelled against them. So as he says, Mida Kineged Mida, Shehim Shalalem Kadesh Baruch Avdehem, that their servants were, were ruled over them, the Heimichrisim, and they were wiped out. That's the Ramban. Okay? So it seems to be the Rambam, again, the first Marmachim of the Rambam told us that the establishment of Malchus based Chashmanoi is something to be celebrated. Something to be celebrated. It's part of the victory of the Chashmanoi, it's part of the celebration of Hanukkah, is the establishment of not just the Jewish kingdom, but the establishment of Malchus based Chashmanoi. The Ramban, on the other hand, is telling us, not like that, the Ramban is telling us that this is, not, that even though Hanukkah is to be celebrated, and the removal of the Greeks is to be celebrated, but Malchus Beis Chashunayim is not to be celebrated. That was something that was incorrect, and eventually we're wiped out because of that. Okay. <clears throat> so what we're going to focus on this morning, just for a little bit, is on the opinion of the Rambam. The Rambam. The problem with the Rambam is, what about the Ramban's issue? The, the Pasuk does say, Yaakov Yudin did say, Lo Yosef Shevet Mi Yudin, Mechayk Mei Rambam. And many times we have this in Tanakh, that Dovr mm-hmm. Melch says that Hashem chose me to be the Melech, and so on. And so we, we do have this idea, and that's without a question, there is an idea that rulership should be in the tribe of Yehuda, and specifically the family of Dovr Melech. And that's exactly the Ramban's point, of why the Hashemunayim were incorrect in what they did. So the question is, what is the, how, did the, how does the Rambam say that we celebrate the, the house of the Hashemunayim? Uh, they did do something wrong. They were not right in establishing that Malchus. So that, that's question number one. What does the Rambam do with the fact that the Chashmonaim seemed to uh, go against that Pasuk of Lo Shevet Mi Yehuda. How do we reconcile that? How does the Rambam ignore that seemingly uh, Avera that they did of removing the Malchus from the house of David, from the, from the Shevet of Yehuda? That's problem number one. Problem number two is also just a general problem, even in the Ramban, which is, if they did something wrong in establishing a Malchus, then what took so long for them to be punished? Why did it take 200 years? for them eventually to be punished. I mean, if they're doing something wrong right then and there, then something should happen right then and there. Why, what, 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 what exactly changed 200 years later? And again, so, so that's the question. So the, the fact that nothing happened for 200 years seems to indicate that it was okay. 
But then, then what happened 200 years later, that all of a sudden Hashem changes his mind, no, 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 there's something wrong going on over here. So the whole thing needs explanation. Was it right? Was it wrong? I says we're going we're gonna to investigate this. Okay, so, but in order to, again, but like I said, we're going to be focusing more on the Rambam and explaining the, 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 the halachic significance and state and situation of Malchus Beis Chashmina in the way of the Rambam. But again, the, the problem we had was in the Rambam is why is the Rambam ignoring the, the Aveira that the Chashmina seemed to do? Well, Yosef Shevim Yud, it says in Pasuk that the Malchus should be in the tribe of Yud and the Malchus Beis David. <coughs> okay, so <coughs> let's begin like this. In Marmokka number three, this is, again, also that Ramban. That Ramban, again, in Parshas Vayechi, discusses the whole Indian of Malchus. You know, th- this is, this is a, uh, this, let, let's see Marmokka number three inside together. And then after we see it together, I'll, 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 I'll point out to you what I'm trying to bring out from this particular piece. It says in Ramban like this. Vakos, this is, again, this is a, a paragraph that's a little bit before the paragraph of Marmokka number two. You'll see, you'll see what I mean. Vakasav has said this pasuk says the Ramban that he's talking about over there. Yosher Shevet Yehuda, right? That the scepter Malchus should remain in Shevet Yehuda. Vakasav has said Ramaz, this pasuk is hinting us ki Yaakov himlech Shevet Yehuda lecha that Yaakov is mamlech. Yaakov Vinu, uh, 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 you know, gave Malchus, he gave kingship to the tribe of Yehuda lecha over his other brothers. Vahayrish li Yehuda v'mshal Yisrael, and he gave Malchus as an inheritance to Yehuda over the Jewish people. David, and this is something that David Melch also hints to in Navi. It says in Pasuk, David Melch said, this is, a, this is a quote from David. Says David Melch, Hashem chose me for my entire family, for my entire father's house. To be the king over the Jewish people forever. Says Ramban. The way Malchus works, says Ramban, is. That the Rabbanu Shloilam, obviously Yaak, it's Yaakov Inu. Yaakov Inu is, is speaking with Nehu and Ruch HaKadosh. The Rabbanu Shloilam chooses Yehuda, Shevet Yehuda, to be the ruler. Uwe Beis Yehuda, Beis Avi. And then from within the family of Yehuda, the Rabbanu Shloilam then shows the family of Yishai, right? Uwe Vnei Avi, B. And from the family of Yishai, the Rabbanu Shloilam then shows specifically Dovna Melech. Ratzel Hamlech HaKal Yisrael to rule over the Jewish people. In other words. What the Ramban is telling us is as follows, that the way we have to th- view Malchus, eventually, like in other words, eventually Malchus finds its way specifically to the family of David and Melch. Right? That's what we know, based on it. And Mashiach comes, Mashiach, does, Mashiach has to have certain qualifications, and one of them, one of the most basic ones is Zerah David, Mashiach ben David, right? He has to come from a family of David. Says the Ramban, how did it get to David and Melch? Well, says the Ramban, it worked it went through a process of inheritance. First, Yaakov Avinu gives Malchus to Shevet Yehuda, and just like anything else that inheritance, it then goes down father to son, and so on. So if you have a large estate, you can divide up amongst all your kids, but there's only one Melech. So, that, you know, you gotta, you gotta pick the family he goes to. So Rav Hashem give, gives it to Yehuda, and from Yehuda then travels down all the way to the specific family of Yishai, and from Yishai it goes to David. But in other words, says the Ramban, the Malchus of David HaMelech is not, it's not like David was chosen from the rest of Klai Yisrael. It was already given over to Shevet Yehuda, and David is Yarshining, he's inheriting the Malchus that was already given over to Shevet Yehuda. So it's Yehuda to Yishai to David. And then once it gets to David, okay, so now it's, it's remaining in, in that line. But, but the Malchus itself is not something that's, Specific to David per se, it's again like Yaakov Yudin says, Yosef Shevet Mi Yehuda, Ruchek Bein Raglov, and from within Shevet Yehuda, so that's what David, that's what he says. The Rebbeinu Shem shows Yehuda, and from Yehuda the Malchus was inherited by Yishai, and from Yishai was inherited by David and Melech, and it stays within that family. But it all traces its roots back to Mal, to Shevet Yehuda, which is what Yaakov Yudin says. That's the opinion of the Rambam. The Rambam is not like this, even though the pasuk says that you, that Yaakov Yudin says Yosef Shevet Mi Yehuda. It's interesting. Nowhere in the Rambam, not in Hilchas Malachim, not in his introduction to Mishnayis, not in his introduction to Perachelik, where the Rambam talks about kings and Mashiach and so on, nowhere does the Rambam ever say that Malchus is within the jurisdiction and within the ownership of Yehuda. And just for within Yehuda, it's the family of David and That's not what the Rambam says. Take a look at Maramukha number four. <coughs> this is the Rambam again in the beginning of Hilchas Malachim. <coughs> the Rambam over here is talking about the concept of, of Malchus, of kingship, going 
going down, going, being passed down through inheritance. Because that we know, that if a person's a king, his son becomes a king. And the Raman, by the way, says that this is not just for kingship. This is true for every position of authority within the Jewish people, that if the, 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 if the son is worthy of taking that position, it goes by inheritance. This is what the Raman says. Again, Perak Alf, Allah Zayin, and Hilchas Molochem. Me'achir Shemayshkan HaMelech, once the king is anointed, and he's now a king, now he he's the rightful owner so to a certain degree it's certain saying he has the rights to be a king and he acquires this to a certain degree for him and his descendants it's now again it's like property it's something that he now has rights to and his inheritors have rights to it first malchus Yerushalayim, malchus kingship any level of position as well to a certain degree again there's there's qualifications for this but Malchus and Sarora and uh, leadership and so on and so forth, authority, that's something that's passed down as an inheritance. Shinemar, the Pasik says, that the king should have an Arichas Yamim on his throne, who Banov carries all him and his sons, him and his children. So you see, the Pasik is talking about Malchus being something that's related to him and your children. That's Yerusha. So that's, that's the Rambam. Says the Rambam continues. Kivan Shanim Shach David. Says the Rambam, and once David was anointed, Zacha Bekesar Malchus, now is David and Melch in particular now owns. He is the uh, authority over kingship by the Jewish people. And now the Malchus is by him and his male descendants that are worthy of it, they're within his uh, they're within his possession. Shnemar, the Basik says, Kisachain Ad Oilam, that his throne should be established forever properly. Again, the Rambam doesn't say the same thing as the Ramban. If the Ramban was writing this, what would the Ramban say? The Ramban would say that Yehuda was kind of Malchus, Yehuda was, acquired Malchus, and, it descent, and now it's part of an inheritance within the tribe of Yehuda. And specifically within Yehuda, it was inherited by the family of Yishai. And specifically within the family of Yishai, it was inherited by David. Make some reference to the fact that it's within the tribe of Yehuda. That's the main, that's the main point over here. Says the Rambam not like that. The Rambam doesn't say anything about Shevet Yehuda. The Rambam says something new, that it's David. That it's David. So what we see is a machlek is between the Ramban and the Rambam. What exactly, everyone agrees to the facts, which is that Dovna Melech is the king, and his descendants are the ones that have authority over kingship, and Mashiach is going to be then David. But the question is, what exactly is the relationship between Malchus and Dovna Melech? Says the Ramban, it's not so much David himself, it's not like Malchus mm-hmm. begins and ends with David. Malchus begins with Shevet Yehuda. From Shevet Yud, again, it goes with inheritance, like everything else, so then it goes to particular families. You can't have, again, when, uh, if you're talking about an estate, you could divide it up. You can't divide up Malchus evenly, right? These are the one person, so you have to pick a family. So Rabban Hashem picked Yishai, and from Yishai picked David. So in the, in the way of the Ramban, again, it's, it's, Malchus is really within Yehuda, and from there, it finds its way to David. In the Ramam, it's not like that. Malchus is specific to David and Melech. And although before David and Melech, there was such a thing that Malchus was in the authority of Shevet Yehuda. The Yaakov even did say, well, you asked Shevet and Yehuda, so that's true. But says the Rambam, that was all until David comes. Once David comes, he's not inheriting the Malchus that was already in his tribe and in his family. David and Melech acquires Malchus on his own. And from that point on, the Malchus is in the rightful possession of David and Melech, not because he's a member of Shevet Yehuda, because he's David and Melech. Now there's a halachic nafkamina based on this. If you, it's interesting, the Avni Nezer, in one of his tshuvas, I think it's in uh, your day, I think Shin Yud Beis, he talks about, he makes the following diak. In Marmokka number four, again, the Rambam that we just saw, so the first part of the Rambam was talking about the general idea of Malchus, of kingship, going down in inheritance. And then the second part of the sentence, he like zoned in on David and Melch himself. The Avni Nezer points to a subtle difference. Again, let's read together the Rambam Marmokka number four together. Again, just to Chazur again. Says the Rambam again. Ma'achar shemayish lemelech. Once a king is anointed, and again the Rambam is talking about a king, but this is all like I said before. This is true for all levels of authority. Harez ezoicha loy ulaban of loylam. It goes. He means the, the king acquires Malchus, and it's for him and all of his children, his descendants. Right? It goes the inherit shemalchus Yerushalim because Malchus is something that goes be Yerushalim. So when the Rambam is talking about the generalities of Malchus. The Rambam said it goes to the king, Ula Banov, and to all of his children. Now, when it comes to David and Melech, though, the Rambam says like this: Kivan Shanim Shach David. Once David was anointed, Zacha Bekesa Malchus, so he now acquires Malchus. 
Where Yamalchus Loi will be one of Hazcharim Hakshirim. Says the Rambam, once David and Malchus acquires Malchus, it also goes in inheritance. But now the inheritance is a little bit more specific. When it came to the general concept of the, of of authority going in, in down inheritance, the only qualification needed was Bonav. Are you a descendant of, of the Melech? But once David and Melech acquires the Malchus, says the Rambam, now something else kicks in. Not only do you have to be a descendant of David, you have to be what? Mi Bonav Hasacharim. You have to be a male descendant. And Ksherim. And you have to be a Kasher Yid. What's, <laughs> what does Rambam mean by that? So says the Abbe Nezer Chiddush. Now the Nezer says that let's say you have a king from the house of David and Melech, and he only has daughters. Now a daughter, a woman, is not going to be able to be the king anyway. Mm-hmm. But let's say his daughter has a son. So in rules of regular inheritance, let's, so that's the situation. The guy has uh, a guy passes away, and he has a daughter who has a son. So he has a grandson, and he has a brother. So where does the Yerusha go? So the Lachas of Yerusha, it goes to the grandson. <laughs> Because although, although he has a male heir, theoretically that's a brother, but a descendant, a direct descendant, like a grandson, is going to come first. Says Davne Nezer, so that's true for Malchus as well, until David. Because in terms of before David and Melech, the way to think of kingship, in, uh, the way to think of the inheritance of kingship is no different than the way to think of inheritance of estates, which is it goes to the proper, the proper heirs, the proper uh, inheritance. And in the rules of inheritance, so a grandson, even if it's through, uh, you know, through a daughter, but a grandson is going to come first, before an uncle, before a brother, and, and so on and so forth. But says the Nezer, but when it comes to Dov and Amelech, once he acquires Malchus, then something else kicks in. This is not, once Dov and Amelech owns the Malchus, then anyone that the Malchus is then given over to is not functioning in the regular rules of inheritance. Says the Nezer Chiddush. The Nezer says, once Dov and Amelech acquires the throne, then any descendant that's going to, so to speak, inherit the kingship from David cannot, cannot just be seen as an inheritor of David. They have to be seen as a, as a replacement of David. Not replacement is the wrong word. As a reemergence of David, as just a continuation of David himself. When David, I'll give you an example. When David Melch in, in Tanakh, in Novi, when David Melch is dying and he establishes, and you know, there's a whole, it was a controversy who's going to be the next king. So David Melch makes a whole assembly and he says, the next is going to be Shlema HaMelech, my son Shlema. And so the Pasuk says that as a response to all of to that statement, the response of, 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 of the Tzaddikim and, you know, and, and, and Bathsheba that was there, they said, Yichi HaMelech David, Lailon Vlad, that David Melch should live forever. So, such a thing, David Melch lives forever. He's on his deathbed, he's about to die. That's why he's setting up his son to be the Melech after him, because he's not going to live forever. The answer is what's being said by that sentence is that don't think of Shleim HaMelech as, as, as inheriting Malchus from David. It's like a person passes away, they have a large estate, and it goes to the inheritor. It goes to the son, it goes to the grandson, it goes to the nephew, whatever the case may be. It, what's the shot with that? What the nephew all of a sudden has in, he, he, he is the embodiment of his, of his uh, uncle. He's not the embodiment of his uncle, he's his own person. It happens to be. The estate goes to him. It just it moves from his uncle to the nephew. But not so when it comes to Malchus based David. That would have been true with kingship until David. That there was a tri- there was a king, uh, uh, Shaul was a king. And so Shaul passes away, let's in theory. So Shaul passes away. Now the Malchus wants to go in, the, in an inheritance to his son Yonason. Yonason is not Shaul. Yonason is not pretending to be his father. He's not taking, he's not stepping into the shoes of his father. He's Yonason. But where does the Malchus go? So it goes to, to Yonason because it started by his father. It goes to Yerusha, just like the money of Shaul goes to his son. Not so with David. Says the Avinez, that's what the Rambam is trying to tell us, that the inheritor of the Malchus of David and Melech has to literally be seen as, for, as filling the shoes of David. It's, this, 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 is, this is a reemergence of David himself. Therefore, says, says the Avinez, in the language of the Rambam, it's not enough that you qualify to be an inheritor in Hilchus Yerusha. You have to be able to be seen as a as as a as as a reemergence of David himself, you have to be seen as if you are Mamish David himself. In order to have that, you have to have your lineage has to be directly with males, and you have to be kosher. And that's exactly what the Rambam is telling us that for the Malchus of David and Melech, once he establishes the Malchus, Malchus Lai Ulabanav Hasacharim Hakshirim. But if you have a line to David, but it's not through males, or you yourself are not a kosher or a yid. 
worthy of, of taking upon yourself the title of David HaMelech, then, then you don't have a shaykhist to the Malkus. In other words, again, this, and this is fundamentally going with this, with this Nakuda. The Ramban, again, in the world of the Ramban, Malchus is in the Shevet Yehuda, and it goes to uh, with And within Yehuda, it fell Yerusha to David, and from David, it continues on in his family, but it's working within the regular rules of Hilchus Yerusha. It was first given to Shevet Yehuda, and from there, it descends, it descends uh, downward. But in the Rambam, it's not the way it's working. In the Rambam, Malchus, it, until David and Malach, was in a system of Yerusha. Once David Melch comes, it's not a Yerushadik Indian. This is now acquired by that person that's called David Melch. And anyone further down the line is not inheriting the Yerusha from David who inherited from his father, from eventually Yehuda. No, no, no. It's David, it begins and ends with David. Anyone later on that's becoming a king from the house of David is just a reemergence of David himself. That's, that's the way, that's the word of the Rambam. Again, that's why in order to qualify for that, you have to be a direct descendant from, from males, and you have to be kosher. This would explain to us also another uh, sack of the Rambam in Marmokka number five. <coughs> so this is the Rambam all the way to the end of Hilchas Malachim. He talks about the coming of Mashiach, and the Rambam gives us certain qualifications of what Mashiach is going to have to, that person that, that, that's, that's going to be Mashiach is going to have to check certain boxes. So this is what the Rambam says. In Yamid Melech and Beis David, if you have a king that established that 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 uh, becomes established in the house of David, and so he has to check certain boxes, like I said, in order to prove that he's Mashiach. What are the boxes? How give a Torah? He has to be involved in Torah learning. Isaac be mitzvahs, and he has to be involved in mitzvahs. Kedavid Aviv, like his grandfather David. Kifit Tarsh Vichsav Shabal Peh, based on Tarsh Vichsav and Tarsh Shabal Peh, he has to be. A tzaddik like David, the Yochov Kol Yisrael Leilich and he has to be he has to be involved in trying to compel the Jewish people to keep Torah mitzvahs, and to uh, to reinforce reinforce uh, the, the the world of Torah, the Yochov Mechemes Hashem to fight the wars of Hashem. Reizu Becheskes and Moshech. That's already a good chazaka. That's that already you could assume this person is Moshech. Where did the Rambam come up with this? That in order to prove yourself, in order to to claim to be a proper melech, you have to be Isaac Batar and Mitzvah's Kedavid Aviv. That's a, that's, a, that's, a high, that's a high bar to set, Kedavid Aviv. And halachically, this is halacha. Where's the wrong coming from? Well, the answer is, according to Avin Yezra, this is exactly the point. You cannot, listen, in order to be a melech mi based David, in order to be Mashiach ben David, it's not the shot that you have to be worthy of being a melech and an inheritor of David and Melech. No, no. It's not just a matter of inheriting estates, and just happens to be it goes to you, and you, know, you, you okay, you know, you're not so bad. No, no, you have to be able to say about, uh, on yourself when you put on the throne that you are bechinas david, that you are bechinas david. I f- physically, you're not david melech, but you are embodying what david melech means. You are embodying that Indian that's called david melech. In order to do that, so that, that's not just a matter of, you know, yeah, he's pretty good, he's good enough. That's not good. You have to get david of it. That's exactly what the Rambam is telling us. In other words, so what we see according to the Rambam is a Chiddush, that once David HaMelech was chosen, then the way to discern whether a person is worthy of Malchus or not is not so much, again, what Shevet you're from. It's no longer an Indian of Shevet. It's now an Indian of who is able to embody that Bechina, that quality that's called David HaMelech. Okay. Now, obviously, on, on a simple level, the way to discern that would be, again, you are a descendant, a male descendant of the Amalek, and you're a kosher yid, so you fit those bills. But let's go a little bit into Pneumius. This Indian of Dov and Amalek, like, what is this? That Dov and Amalek, on his own, Zaych of the Keser Malchus, what is this? So who was Dov? Again, in the world of the Rambam right now, we're seeing that Dov and Amalek is not just a member of a particular tribe who's a big tzaddik. David HaMelech in the world of the Rambam right now, in terms of being a king, is now being seen as an independent figure. He's an independent figure. He's not just from Shevet Yehuda and you know, able to trace his lineage back to Malchus, which was given from Yaakov to Yehuda. He is on his own. So who is David HaMelech? <coughs> so Chazal said the following thing. Chazal say that the throne of Hashem, the Merkava, of the Rabbani Shalom has four legs. Has four legs. And we have a ref- this is referenced in many places in Chazal, the four legs of the Merkava. And who are the four, and who, which tzaddikim are the four legs of the Merkava? So I'll explain what I mean in a moment. 
So as I'll say, the, the fourth tzaddikim are Avram, Yisuf, and Yaakov, and the fourth leg is David and Melech. You know, for example, on Sukkot, right? Sukkot, we have the Ushpizim, yeah? Mm-hmm. So you have the Ushpizim. You have Avram, Yisuf, and Yaakov, Moish, Aaron, Yosef, and David. There's something different about those tzaddikim. And again, the four, Avram, Yisuf, and Yaakov, David, are sort of a, a more concentrated version, and a more condensed version, a more abbreviated version of the seven Ushpizim. Moshe, Aaron, and Yosef, you, you could sort of see them as just extensions of Avram, Yisuf, and Yaakov. That's not for now, but... When, so let, let's talk about this for a second. You have this idea of the seven Ushpizim, yeah? Or again, a more concentrated, condensed version, the four legs of the Merkava, Avram, Yitzhak, Yaakov, and David. Are the, what does that mean? Those are, the, those are the seven or four greatest Hadikim to ever exist? They're greater? Was, uh, they, they were, the answer is it's not greater. The concept of the Ushpizim, or the concept of the four Tzadikim that are the Raglaim or the Merkava is that those individual Tzadikim existed on two levels. They were individual people. So Avram was his own person. If you want to count the minion, for example, Avram is uh, one Yid, and you need nine others. And Yitzchak as well, and Yaakov and David, they were individual people with their Yonim. But on the other hand, those seven Tzadikim, or four Tzadikim in a more concentrated version, as I said, are more than just individual people. All of Nishmas Yisrael, every individual Jew, is comprised of elements of those particular Tzadikim. Avram, Yitzchak, Yaakov, and David are not just individual tzaddikim, they happen to be extremely great, and because of their greatness, they were given certain gifts. Avram Avinu is given, uh, you know, uh, his gifts, and Yitzchak, and Yaakov, and David. No, no. Every neshama is made of certain parts. And the basic building blocks of every single Jew is a piece of Avram, Yitzchak, Yaakov, and David. Those seven ushbizim that visit us on Sukkot, it's not the chat seven great tzaddikim. So you have other tzaddikim. Why, what about... Uh, you know, B'tzal was also big tzaddik. The answer is, it's not the pshat that we're just being visited by big tzaddikim. Every single Jew is comprised and made up of these particular parts that are, the, that are embodied by those individuals. Avram Avinu, there's a part of every yid, a fourth, so to speak, a quarter of every yid is a, is a piece of Avram Avinu. And another fourth of every yid is a piece of Yitzchak, and Yaakov, and David, and so on. And so every single yid is a... Is a, is a is a, is, is a composite of pieces of these tzaddikim. This is what it means that these tzaddikim are the four legs of the Merkava. The Jewish people, you can look at the Jewish people in two different ways. On the one hand, you can look at us as a people, a nation, amongst other nations, human beings with genealogies and yichas and a story and a history. It happens to be we're given divine message, uh, uh, divine avoidance. And... Uh, and, and a divine shlichus, and a divine purpose. But ultimately, who we are, are, are human beings. Or there's another way to look at the Jewish people, that we're not human beings. We are, the, we are vessels for the Rabbinic Shloilam to be manifest in the world. We are vessels to allow the Rabbinic Shloilam to manifest in the world. We're not people that the Rabbinic Shloilam chose and says, okay, you know what, do things for me. Who we are is a vessel through which the Rebbe Hashem's presence comes into the world. That's what it means, Merkava. What does it mean in Merkava? Merkava means a chariot, right? It means a car. What is a car? A car is nothing. A car is a vehicle to allow you to move through the world, right? And you have to get to point A to point B. You don't have to ask permission of your car. You don't tell your car to go. You get in your car and you drive with your car. Your car is your legs. Your car is just a mode of your transportation. So when we talk about the, the, those Four tzaddikim, Avram, Mitzvah, and Yaakov, and David, being the four legs of the Merkava. And those are the four tzaddikim that are the, that every single Jew is made up of pieces of them. What that means is that, that there's a side of the Jewish people that who we are is nothing but a, a mode of transportation for God. We allow the Rabbani Shalom into the universe. <coughs> That's what it means to, for the Jewish people to be a Merkava from the Rabbani Shalom, and those four tzaddikim, obviously Yaakov and David, are the embodiment of this concept of being a Merkava. Now, specifically, specifically, these four tzaddikim, and again, you'll, you'll see where I'm coming from in a moment, these four tzaddikim, Avram, Yisuf, Yaakov, and David, as I said, those four tzaddikim are more than just individual people. They represent the basic building blocks and ingredients that create a Jewish soul, and created Jewish soul specifically with the task and the mission of allowing God's 
God's existence to come into the world. That that those basic building blocks of Avram, Yaakov, and David are, and again, they all come together to allow a Jew to be a vehicle for God, are divided in two basic parts. Avram, Yitzhak, Yaakov on one side, and David on the other. <clears throat> there are two levels of Hashem's presence that we act as a Merkava for to allow into the world. One side of Hashem's presence that we act as a Merkava for is, is God's presence when it's very clear and noticeable and obvious. When miracles take place, for example. That's, a, that's that's the Rabbani Shalom making his way into reality in a very obvious and clear way. And when the Jewish soul is activated to act as a Merkava for that level of godliness, it's specifically using the Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov ingredients. And so too it is with Tyra. Tyra is also a way of Hashem entering into the world. And there's a certain part of Tyra which is, which is activated specifically the Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov part, and that is Tyra Shebech the written Torah. What is the written Torah? The written Torah is Hashem speaking through prophecy. That's just like you have open miracles, so you have open revelation of what God wants of us. So just as, again, it's only, again, it's a lot of ideas over here, but just to explain, it's only through the Jewish soul that the Rabbani Shalom is able to come into the world. The, the Jewish soul has to be a Merkava to allow Hashem to come into the world. Hashem is not going to reveal His will and is not going to reveal His Torah or His hand unless it's operating through Nishma Sisra. But that side of Taira and that side of Hashem's hand, which is obvious and open and revealed, that's going to be happening through the Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov part of who we are. That's why Tanakh, which is the open revelation of God's will, is comprised of three parts, Taira, Nevi'im, Suvim. That's all Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. But when the, Jew, when the Rabbani Shalom is, is coming into the world through his Merkava, through the Jewish soul, but in a way that's more hidden, that's more tzniyistic, that's more subtle. Mm-hmm. It means, means hidden miracles. Or in Torah, it means Tarsh Baal Peh, right? Tarsh Baal Peh is, is also Hashem's will, but it's already concealed and it's covered over. It doesn't look as obvious as God, right? When, when a Navi is telling you something, clearly that's the Rabbani Shlom. And then Hashem is channeling through the Navi Avram Yitzhak and Yaakov ingredients. But then when you have Ramesha Feinstein sitting down, or, uh, you know, whoever the Paisik is, whatever the, the, you know, Gemara and so on, whatever the, 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 the Tzadik is that's dealing with the Shiloh, it's not Nevoah. He's coming up with stuff on his own. But it's also Hashem speaking through, through him. But now it's already more concealed. When the Rabbani Shleilam reveals himself in a more concealed way, whether it be with hidden miracles or in, in Torah, Tarsh Baal Peh, that's specifically using the ingredient of David HaMelech. So these are the four ingredients that comprise Nishma Yisrael that define us as a Merkava, as a conduit, as a vehicle for the Rabbani Shalom to come into the world. Avram Yitzhak and Yaakov is going to be the part of the soul that acts as a vessel for the Rabbani Shalom to come into the world in a revealed way. And Dovid HaMelech is the, is the part of the Neshama that allows the Neshama to be a vehicle for God when he enters the world in a concealed way. Tarash Vichsav versus Tarash Al Peh. Take a look at Maramokim number six. This is the Maral. This is all summed up in the language of the Maral. This is in Chedush HaGadis and Sanhedrin, Kuzayin, and Reveiz. He's talking about this idea of these four tzaddikim, Avi, Mr. Yaakov, and David being the chariot. David HaMelech equals all three of us. When, he, when we're talking about the Jewish soul being a vehicle for God in a way that our world can handle, in a way that fits with our world, where it's not overwhelming. When the Ovis Akdashim, when those ingredients in the soul are being active as a Merkava, uh, then it's, it's crazy. Uh, miracles, Nevoa, it's like things that are just not, they don't fit. <laughs> they don't seem to fit in the world. Dovr HaMelech already means a Merkava, it means a chariot, it means a channel for the Rabbani Shlom in a way that the Merkava, that the world able, is able to make sense of it, we, we, could, uh, we could handle it. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't overwhelm us to see a Tzadik Paschal in the Shiloh. It's not the... It's, it's also Derech So let's go back. So we have this idea from the Rambam. Well, let's go back. This idea of the Rambam. That the Melech, the Melech, once David HaMelech was chosen, it begins and ends with David. David HaMelech is then, owns Malchus to such a degree that it's no longer, go, it doesn't go back to Yehuda, and it doesn't move from David. It always is by David. And a, and so, and, and a descendant of David HaMelech that's inheriting the throne, he's not inheriting the throne from David. 
He is a, he's just a reestab. He is David. He's just a continuation of David. It's all David Amelach. <coughs> this I, this Indian of David Amelach being the beginning and end of Malchus is because David Amelach is not just an individual member of the Jewish people. You see again, if David Amelach is an individual member of the Jewish people, then what Shevet is he from? What Shevet is he from? He asked, you know, where is he coming from? Okay, he's coming from Yehuda. In the world of the Ramban, the Ramban is looking at David as an individual member of the Jewish people. If he's an individual member of the Jewish people, what makes him the Melech? Okay, because he arshined it from his father, who eventually arshined it from his father, from Yehuda, who was given it by Yaakov Avinu. But the Rambam is, is, it, Rambam is telling us that the Malchus, as it's, as it's owned by David Melech, is not coming from David Melech as an individual person amongst the Jewish people, that where did he get his money from? Where did he get his authority from? The Rambam is telling us that the Malchus of David Melech is coming because David Melech is the fourth leg of the Merkav. And David Melech is different. He's not just an individual tzaddik that was uh, exceptionally great. David Melech is, a, is an ingredient that is the essence of every single neshama. He's not, he's like the Ovis in that degree. No, it's just like the Ramban would say that uh, ultimately Yaakov Avinu had the right to give Malchus over because he, he's one of the Ovis. Says the Ramban, well, David is also one of the Ovis. He's, he, again, he's not one of the Ovis, you know, Ainavis al Shlesha, but in terms of the Merkava, he is, like the, like the Maral says, he's equal to the Ovis Mitzad HaMakabal. He is the fourth leg of the Merkava. He is the fourth ingredient in every single neshama. And that's what makes him larger than life. It makes him more than just the individual person. Malchus, therefore, begins and ends by David. Because if David Malchus is just an individual Jew, then where is he getting his yichas from? Like, where is he coming from? He's out of nowhere. Says the Ramam, yeah, he's out of nowhere because he's not, he's not just one of the descendants of the Shvat. He's Bechal, something else. He's one of the, he is the, he is the, the fourth leg of the Merkava, just like the others are. That's what the Ramam is telling us. And because of that, Malchus begins and ends with that. Based on all of this, if David Amalek's Malchus is coming, according to the Rambam, because of not him as an individual, but because of him as the fourth leg of the Merkava, that means that every single Jew has within him an aspect of David Amalek. Mm-hmm. And it's that aspect of David Amalek that if you can connect to it and you could embody that particular aspect of David Amalek, it means that you are Bechinas David. And then the same authority that David has to be the king, you have the authority to be the king because you're Bechinas David. In other words, what's the difference between anyone that's not physically David Amalek is only the rightful king because he's Oymid Bemakim David. He's taking the place of David Amalek. And the reason why every Jew can, the reason why that's possible is because David Amalek is larger than life. David Amalek is not an individual Jew. He is the embodiment of a certain element of every single neshama. Every single neshama has, an, has a nitzitz, has a spark of David HaMelech. David HaMelech is the sum total of all those sparks. But anyone that's able to be the king, what he's doing as a king is that he is living and he is, exp- he is the expression of that particular spark. Therefore, if theoretically you can have someone who's maybe not technically, biologically from David HaMelech, but through divine providence, they are the embodiment of that quality that's called David HaMelech, you can make the argument that they have the rightful heir to the throne. Because the whole th- Malchus is, is not, it's not a Yerusha thing that you have to know where the Yichus is coming from. It's not, a, it's, not a, it's not a monetary issue. The question is, who is Davr Melech? Who is Bechinas David? Who is Bechinas David of the generation? Whoever is Bechinas David of the generation, that's the Melech. Take a look at Marmokka number 7. This is the Preet Tzadik, or Tzadik HaKain Rublin, his first piece in Hanukkah. Shehoye Oz HaChashmanoi Mizera Aaron. Times of Chashmonaim, right? They were obviously biologically they were Kahana, they were descendants of Aaron Akain. But Shayu Shoyrish Tarish of Everyone knows one of the basic uh, you know sort of subplots, I guess you could say of Hanukkah is that what? Is that this was a time when Navua ended, and this is a time where the Greeks were infiltrating our camps and trying to convince the Jewish people that you have your that 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 you know that you have your uh, you know intellectual exercises and you have your you know uh, things that you come up with we have art there, there, there's science there's mathematics and there's Talmud and it's all the same it's all human it's all human yeah if you're talking about prophecy okay prophecy is something from a higher place but Tarsh Peh, the oral Torah what is it it's a human being coming up with new ideas and this, when we talk about the exile of Greece the exile of Greece on a, on a, on a deeper level was was 
thinking of Tarsh Peh as man-made. Thinking of Tarsh Peh as man-made, not realizing its divine origin. Or in other words, the Gulf of Yavin was a, a attack against that fourth leg of the Merkava. Because again, what is the what is the Nesol of David Melech mean? The soul of David Melech means the way through which the Rabbi Shalom, God comes into our universe in a more mysterious way, whether it be through hidden miracles or Tarsh Peh. Thinking of Tarsh Peh as man-made, not something that's of divine origin, is trying to rip off that leg from the Merkava, trying to trying to imagine that the Merkava is only Avram and God talk, When God talks, it's only, only Tanakh. But God does not talk anymore through Tarsh Peh. If you have anything in Tarsh Peh, it's your ideas, it's not God's ideas. That's a rejection of that fourth Merkava. The Chashvenoyim who are to fight against the Yavanim, who reestablish the Jewish faith in Tarsh Peh, that Tarsh Peh is of divine origin, they were the embodiment of David HaMelech. They are the embodiment of that fourth regal, that fourth, that fourth leg on the Merkava. There was no one of greater right to Malchus based David at that time than the Chashvenoyim. The whole Indian of Malchus based David the whole Indian that makes Davin in the world of Rambam, that makes him the rightful owner of Malchus, is the fact that now he's part of a certain tribe that was given, no, no, he himself, I, what makes him himself, he's just a Jew amongst any Jews, you know what I mean, he's just number one of a minion, like what, what makes him so special, the answer is, he's not just an individual person, he's the embodiment of that fourth leg of the Merkava, and that's exactly what was under attack by the Yavanim, and that's exactly what the Chashvanoyim brought back to us, the reestablishment and the reaffirmment and the, and, 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 and the belief in that fourth Merkava, they, and, and again, that quality of David exists in every Jew, but the Chashvanoyim were embodying that, they were fighting for that, they were, they were their, their victory over the Yavanim was the re-establishment of that, of that regal, that fourth, that fourth regal, of the belief in Tarsh Baal Peh as something that descends from on high in a more hidden, in a more tznias, in a more modest, in a more covered way. Their whole inyan was to establish Malchus based on it. And therefore the, the rightful owners of Malchus based on it at that time, who were the ones that were the embodiment of that fourth regal? Who were the ones of the generation that were expressing their spark of David, it was the Hashanah. And therefore, of course, they were the rightful heirs to that Malchus. They were halachically the, 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 the ones to fill the shoes of David and Melch at that time. Let's interrupt something again. The Hashanah were the embodiment of that quality of Tarsh Baal Peh, which is the meat of Malchus. And so on. So therefore, the, let's go back. So we asked the question. According to the Rambam, how does the Rambam just ignore the fact that the Pasuk says, that, the, that Malchus is supposed to be by Yehuda, and the Chashmurim were not the descendants of Yehuda. That's exactly what the Ramban's issue with the Chashmurim. What did the Rambam do with that? The answer is, the Rambam is a holder of Malach. The Ram sees Malchus, once David Malchus is chosen, it's not from Yehuda anymore. It's, 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 it's because of David. And the one that's going to be the Melech of, at any point in time is the one that is the embodiment of Davin Melch. And what does Davin Melch mean? Davin Melch means Tarsh Baal Peh from high. Tarsh Baal Peh from God's mouth. That Tarsh Baal Peh is, 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 is prophecy concealed. That's what Davin Melch means. And so Davka the Chashmulayim, they were the embodiment of that. Fighting the Yivanim, this was the Nakud that they were fighting for. They were the embodiment of Davin Melch at that time. And they are the rightful owners of that Malchus. They are the rightful heirs of that Malchus. What happened 200 years later? So it says we're something like this, two lines before the end. Rakbiyanai. 200 years later, the Chashvenoim began to abandon Tarsh Balpeh. Yanai was one of the last descendants of the Chashvenoim. Nizruka Minus. The Gemara says that he became a Tzaduki, he became an Apikaris, he became someone that denied Tarsh Balpeh. Ubita kol Tarsh Balpeh, who loka chamachos, rakilin and shevet mem shalom. It says we're tzaddik, 200 years later, what was going on? Until for the for two hundred years, the Malchus of the Chashvanoyim were still faithful to that quality that's called Tarsh Baal Peh. And therefore, because of that, the Nakuda of David, the spark of David inside of them was shining. And because of that, they could claim rightful rightful heirs to the throne. But once two hundred years later come, and Yane, the king of the Chashvanoyim at that point, becomes a Tzaduki, he becomes a denier of Tarsh Baal Peh. Well, now already this the spark of David is now concealed. You're not living up to that spark. If you're not living up to that spark, then who, 
then, then who are you? You have no right to the throne anymore. The whole Indian of the Malchus based David is who's going to be Kedavid Ovid? Who's living that that uh, that that concept, that regal revi of the Merkava? You stop doing like that. Uh, now, now you're just taking over the Malchus for, for, with no authority, and because of that, the punishment begins. So the Rama would agree that at some point, if you stop living that Bechin of David, then already you don't have a right to the throne. But until that point, as long as they're living the Malchus of Beis David, then that's that's good to go. Now th- this this Indian, right, listen, it's uh, okay. It's already late, so I'll just I'll just uh, very very quickly. Mama shall regal Achas. This point, if you, if you if you chop it good, if you don't, then don't worry about it. To go a little bit more, but I make a little bit more in depth. Why is this a machlokes between the Rambam and the Ramban? Again, so what we have so far is is that is that the Rambam, the Rambam is the one that's revealing to us this truth that David Melech and Tarsh of Alpeh, that David Melech is the embodiment of, is in truth Dvar Hashem, Dvar Hashem. Just as Hashem communicates through His Merkava in Tanakh. And that's clearly from on high. The Rabbanu was traveling through Nishmas Yisrael, specifically the Avon Yisrael, part of us, to reveal Tanakh. So Rabbanu was also traveling through us to reveal Tarsh Baal Peh. To reveal Tarsh Baal Peh. And that's the truth that's being revealed to in the Rambam. And the Rambam is telling us that's why the Malchus based of it, that's, that's his Malchus. That's the quality of Malchus based of it. The Ramban doesn't view Dov Melch like that, halachically. The Ramban views Dov Melch as a member of the Jewish people. Who happens to have the malchus? Where did he get the malchus from? Like once, once David Melch is just an individual person, then you have to question like where is he coming from? Yaakov wasn't talking to him, so where, where's his malchus coming from? Oh, yeah. So it comes from his father, from his grandfather, from Yehuda. The Rambam, as we know, wrote Mishnah Torah, but it's well known the Rambam did not write any makayrus. Right? It's one of the things that later on we have letters that the Rambam sort of like maybe regretted. He got in trouble from this because like people get got the Mishnah Torah like. We're, where, where is this all coming from? And the Rambam, in fact, writes in his introduction, like I mentioned in the beginning, all you need to have is Tanakh and my Sefer. Tanakh and my Sefer. That's a... And, and the, the Ravid and many, many Rishonim said, like, that's a... To say such a thing, all you need is, all you need is Tanakh and my Sefer. Compare that to the Ramban. So we have also Torah from the Ramban. The Torah that we have from the Ramban are Chedusha and Talmud. Right? And Talmud. Gemara, what's Gemara? Gemara already is telling you where halachas come from, how to figure out halacha, right? That's what the Gemara says. The Gemara, is, the Gemara doesn't take a halacha at face value. A Mishnah says a halacha, what does the Gemara ask? Minon uh, Where's this coming from? Explain to me, logically, how you came to this. And that's the arena that the Ramban writes about. Let's understand. The, 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 the Rambam is, I, I've mentioned this many times from the Rishoner, that the Rishoner said that the Rambam himself was a Bechina Meshech ben David of his generation. Just as Meshech ben David is going to gather up all the Jews to Eretz Yisrael, so the Rambam also gathered together all the halachas scattered throughout the, throughout the Torah Shabal Peh into one place of, um, of Mishnah Torah. But again, just uh, the Rambam, his, his soul is a soul of David HaMelech. The Rambam, therefore, even in the way that he wrote, is writing it as if it's a Dvar Hashem. Like, Tanakh doesn't have Marmakayimus, you understand? Hashem does, you know, the, Hashem says, put on tzitzis, you know, where did you get that idea from? Does this, does. Tanakh doesn't come with footnotes, right? Just, it is what it is. The Tarsh Val Peh that the Rambam wrote for us is also a Tanakh Tarsh Val Peh. It's a Tarsh Val Peh as if it's coming from on high. Arke de that the Rambam said, all you need is Tanakh in my Sefer. So the Rambam is coming from that vantage point of Tarsh Val Peh as being an expression of that fourth leg of the Merkava. Just as Tanakh is from on high, and it comes through that Mer- the three legs of the Merkava, Tarsh Balbek comes from on high, traveling through the fourth leg of the Merkava. And the Rambam expresses this and lives with this in such a way that all of his Svarma are, are along these lines, without Marmachimus. And he says, all you need is Tanakh in my Sefer. And even the name of his Sefer that he called it, Mishnah Tyra. Mishnah Tyra means a repetition of Tanakh. Tanakh says everything you need. I'm just giving you a little bit more of an explanation. I'm just unpackaging it for you. But really, it's all Tanakh. That, that, that's where the Rambam, that, that's where the Neshama is coming from. The, the Ramban is not like that. The Rambam's Neshama was not coming from that Bechina of David. The Ramban's Neshama is coming from that Bechina that's a little bit more down to earth. And the Ramban is, is viewing Tanakh, uh, viewing Tarsh Peh, not Chas Hashem as something man made. That's, that's Yivonim. That, that's the Yivonim. I'm not saying that, Chas Hashem. But the Ramban is. Is coming from at least that chitzonius, that chitzonius perspective that Tarsh Balpeh eventually 
through yigi and through ameos and through effort, you're unearthing and revealing the nevuah that is Tarsh Balka. But in other words, but in order to get to that Devar Hashem, Zuhalacha, in order to get to that prophecy that's called Tarsh Balpeh, you have to do a lot of investigation. So in other words, in other words take a step back just to explain. Eventually, when Ramesha finds him Paskins, and he says, okay, kosher, or he says, pasal, whatever the Pesach is, that's Devar Hashem. But in order to unearth, in order to reveal, in order to allow that Nevua to come into the world, Ramesha had to go through a lot of Amelos, and he had to schwitz, and he had to harvey, he had to think back and forth. He had to do a lot of human effort. But all the human effort, like I've mentioned many times, it's like digging a well. The water is there. The water is there. What is your avayda by digging a well? Just to take away the mechitzes in order to allow the well to come. So there's always two different parts. Once the waters are discovered, then those waters were from Sheshis and Mebreshis. Those are God's waters. But my involvement, what was my avayda? My avayda, was, I had to do a lot of avayda. My human effort was to do all the processes necessary to allow those waters to be revealed. The Rambam, so tar, that's how Tarsh Bapai works too. Eventually, the truth that emerges is a Dvar Hashem. And it's from the fourth Merkav, fourth regular Merkava, just like Tanakh. But in order to discover those waters, you got to put in a lot of human effort. That's where the Yuvanim make the mistake, right? Because they see the human effort, they're like, okay, that's all there is. But we know the truth, that all that human effort is there to allow waters to be revealed that were always there. So the Rambam's soul is coming from the, the waters side of things. The water is always there. And so what is Torah Shabbat in the world of the Rambam? Just basically a non-packaging of Tanakh. It's basically Tanakh. It's basically Tanakh. Eh, Tanakh and my Sefer, it's good to go. The Ramban is, is also agreeing to that at the end of the day. But the Ramban is, 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 is coming, the root of his Nisham is coming from the effort that's needed to get there. And the effort that's needed to get there is Talmud Bavli. Talmud Bavli is, how do you know? Maybe it's a kash like this, it's a stira. And at the end of, uh, at the end of the sukh of Talmud Bavli, you then, you then emerge with Halacha, which is the Dvar Hashem, and that's the Ramban. And so the Ramban, Lishi Tosa, in terms of his writings on Talmud Bavli, and the Ramban's focus on the process to discover those waters, so the Ramban also views Davr Melech not as Davr Melech, the, the pillar of Tarsh Belpeh, which is the Merkava. That's that's Raman there. The, Ram, the Ramban is looking at, at Davr Melch as just a member of the Jewish people because from the Ramban's perspective, in terms of where his root is coming from, in terms of the process of Tarsh Peh, at that stage of digging, Davr Melch is not discovered yet. Davr Melch, who he is in terms of, of being equal to the others, is not yet discovered. You have to, once, once the, the well is dug and waters are found, then you could switch gears and begin to look at Davr as equal to the others. But until that point, you have to put in the effort as if it's your own ideas. And that's the thing. A person, before you learn a Gemara, you have to, you have to act as if it's uh, up to you to figure out, right? If you just go into the Sukkot and say, hey, listen, it's all Devar Hashem anyway. Uh, you're not digging any waters. In order to dig those waters, you have to at least, at least for the time being, pretend as if it's up to you. And that's exactly where the Ramban is coming from. No. So Hashem should help us. We should be zeichet to discover the waters properly with all the efforts needed to discover those waters. We should be to see with our own eyes the return of Malchus Pesach. That would be a skull setting here in the main of Amen.